chant we had just now, who was subject to aging, illness, and death and separation. The Thai translation is a little bit different from the English. In the Thai it says, aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal. But for us, these things are not normal, and we can't keep our minds at normalcy when they happen. They knock the mind off-center, because we keep forgetting to remember, to remind ourselves that these things can happen all the time. We see it all around us. More than 200,000 people die every day. That's a lot of death. And I don't imagine that many of those people who died today knew this morning at sunrise that they were going to die. In that sense, death can take us by surprise. But there's the other sense we should know. It could happen at any time. We should, we should be prepared. If death doesn't hit us first, then aging and illness are going to come as well. These things are normal. It's part of being a human being. When we decided we wanted to become human beings, we weren't thinking about this. We were thinking about how much we would enjoy human life. But this is part of the contract. And so when it's a normal part of life, we have to learn to keep our minds at normalcy when they happen. And to do that, we need to be prepared. This is why we meditate, or we contemplate these things. The Buddha teaches aging, illness, and death. He gives specific advice as what to do to prepare yourself, but he also teaches them just in, in a general sense to remind us we have to be heedful, we have to be careful at all times. That's part of the meditation, you reflect on these things. One of the reflections from monks is that Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I doing right now? If the Buddha were to ask you this, how would you answer? If you were able to answer, I'm okay, developing mindfulness, concentration, discernment, what they call the, the Four Noble Dhammas, virtue, concentration, discernment, and release. Because that would be a good answer. Anything aside from that is heedful, heedlessness. If you wander away from these things, you're wandering off into that territory where aging, illness, and death catch you off guard, catch you off balance. But if you're developing virtue, concentration, discernment, and release, those are the qualities that keep the mind at normalcy. One of the translations for sila, or virtue, is just that, normalcy. This is the normal way of your mind. Notice how the, the Buddha's normal is not necessarily our ordinary state of mind. But remember, for him, defilement is something abnormal. Grief, lamentation, pain, <laughs> distress, and despair are abnormal. They're not intrinsic in the mind. That's good news. If they were intrinsic, we'd be in a lot of trouble. There'd be no escape. But there is the escape, and it starts with this, with virtue, bringing the mind to a place where it can easily refrain from killing, stealing, illicit sex, all the unskillful forms of wrong speech. Once that becomes your habitual way, you're developing a lot of the good, the good qualities that help keep the mind at normalcy. You learn to resist the impulse, say, to, to do something harmful. The impulse may be there, but you don't act on it. That's the beginning of normalcy. In one of the John Lee's talks, he talks about how this is the beginning of what they call heightened mind, which is the quality of concentration. You can lift your mind above its impulses. You don't have to act on them. 
So even if something happens that you really would like to say something really nasty to somebody else because they've behaved in a nasty way, you say, nope, that's beneath me. It's counterproductive. That part of the mind that can pull back from that impulse, that's, that's where we're finding normalcy. Even more so when you practice concentration. Learning to keep the mind steady, no matter what happens. Sounds come and go. Thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future come and go. All these things come and go, but the mind stays steady in the midst of them. And this requires practice, because the nature of the mind, the normal mind, or the ordinary mind, is to get knocked around by these things. It's because you go out and put yourself out there, putting yourself in the line of fire by laying claim to things that get knocked around. So you've got to learn how to let go of that while you're sitting here and meditating. Forget who you are, what your name is, what your nationality is, what your gender is. Let all those things, put all those things aside. All your personal history, put that aside. Just be here in the present moment. Just be with a breath. And you find there is a part of the mind that can stay with the breath. The other parts that would get knocked around you can let go of for the time being. And try to develop this quality of normalcy into the mind that's not affected by things. That's actually normalcy for the mind. It may not be your ordinary state, but you try to learn how to make it more and more normal, more and more ordinary. And this helps when the ordinary and normal things of the world come. You can see them as normal, normal, and your mind can maintain its normalcy even more so when you start developing discernment and looking into this issue of why does the mind lay claim to things. My body, my family, my car, my wife, my husband, my brother, my uncle. Why does it do this? Partly because and we need this sense of I and mine in order to function in the world. But we take it as an ultimate truth. It's not just a convention. It's not just an assumption that helps us in certain circumstances. It becomes something that we hold on to deep down inside. And that's why we've got to learn how to pry loose. To realize that although there may be some cases where the I and mine are useful, there are others where they really cause trouble. There's something we make, and so there, there are things that we can stop making. There's nothing intrinsic in your body that says it's yours. Go down and ask the oxygen atoms, who do you belong to? They don't know anything about it. They ask all the various tissues in the body, whose tissues are these? They'd be at a loss for words. They have no sense of belonging to you. You're the one who's laid claim to them. And in cases where it's useful to know, okay, this is my body as opposed to somebody else's body, that can prevent a lot of problems. But remember, it's a convention. And when you start finding that the convention causes trouble, you have to learn how to let it go. And when you let it go, then you get released. This is one of the basic metaphors in the Buddhist teaching. He takes the burning fire. People in those days believed that fire burns because it holds on to its funeral. Excuse me, hold on. Holds on to its fuel. And then when it lets go, then it's released. In other words, the fuel doesn't hold on to the fire. The fire is the one that's doing the holding on. And to be released, it has to let go. The same with the mind. 
Your suppositions are not holding on to you. You're the one holding on to them. Like this supposition of I and mine. They talk about how when Sarabhut was telling the monks one time that he had surveyed his mind and realized that there was nothing whose change would have any effect on his mind at all. And immediately Ananda asked him, well, what about if anything happened to the Buddha? Wouldn't that upset you? And the sorry, Buddha would say, well, it's, you know, it's a sad thing that such a great being has passed. He's done so much good for the world. But he said the mind wouldn't be affected. And Ananda's comment is revealing. He says, oh, it's a sign that sorry, Buddha has no more conceit, the sense that I am. That's why we grieve. Once you have an I, then it's has its mind, and then from the eye and the mind, then you latch on to things. That can change. And then the reason you grieve is because your eye and your mind are affected. But if you don't start with that initial conceit, then when things change, the change doesn't have to affect you. It doesn't mean you're hard-hearted. In, in Sarabhuta's case, he realizes that the Buddha was doing a lot of good for the world, and it was a good thing to have him there. But the sense of Sarabhuta himself feeling deprived or hurt by the Buddha's passing, that had gone. And so it turned out that Sar the Buddha was not the first to pass away. The Sarabhuta passed away before the Buddha. In the Chinese account, the Buddha gets really upset, and you wonder why they have that version. Because in the original version, it's Ananda's the one who's upset, comes to see the Buddha. This is horrible news. Sariputta's passed away. Ananda says, it's if I lost my bearings. And the Buddha asks, what, what, did he take virtue with him? Did he take concentration with him? Did he take discernment or release with him? Well, no. He hasn't deprived you of anything important, anything that's really valuable in your life. Why get upset? After all, this is the normal way of the world. And what we have to learn to do is keep our minds at normalcy in the midst of all that. Learn how to let go of the things that we've grabbed onto entirely of our own accord. These things haven't grabbed onto us, we've grabbed onto them. And then when they bite back, then we complain about them. We were the ones who grabbed on to begin with. So if we learn how to let go, then no matter what happens, there's a part of the mind deep down inside that's not affected. And because of that, you can still function well, do the proper thing in the face of aging, illness, and death. And that's how you maintain normalcy. This is, this is the normalcy of release. So all these qualities, virtue, concentration, discernment, and release, revolve around this normalcy of mind. They work together. And John Lee has a passage in one of his books where he analyzes virtue. And in his analysis, virtue starts turning into concentration and discernment. He analyzes concentration, and it starts turning into virtue and discernment. He analyzes discernment turns into virtue and concentration. In other words, they infiltrate one another. They all help one another to establish this quality of normalcy. And then yield a, a totally separate kind of normalcy, which doesn't have to be established. It's an unestablished normalcy. They call it the unestablished consciousness. That's the ultimate true normalcy of mind, ultimate freedom. Free from grief, lamentation, despair, free from conceit, aging, illness, any being any effect of aging, illness, and death and separation. That's the potential of the mind. That's the mind at normalcy. So if we see our minds are out of kilter, we do what we can to bring them back in line. Not only for our our own good, but for the good of people around us. That famous story about the acrobat with his assistant. As the assistant said, 
okay, I have to look after my own sense of balance, you look after your sense of balance, and that way we help one another. If you can maintain your balance, your steadiness, in the midst of all the unsteadiness of the world, you're helping the people around you. in addition to helping yourself. That's the good thing about the Buddhist teachings. He found a way that you can help yourself and help others at the same time. He didn't see that there was an inevitable struggle between your own good, your own well-being, and the well-being of people around you. He saw that if you're wise, you can put the two of those together. You can bring them into harmony. And the harmony starts right here by developing this quality of normalcy in your thoughts and your words and your deeds through virtue, concentration, discernment, and release. When the normal events of the world hit a mind that's a true normalcy like this, there's no conflict. So try to develop your mind in that direction. <laughs>